in your gut, do you still think there's going to be a role for humans to do more and more of this? Or do you think automation is, is going to take a lot of the like basic work away? I don't think we're, I don't think humans are going to be replaced with automation anytime soon. The humans are still the people that are finding the flaws. There's a reason why companies pay for automated scans and also manual pen testing. You cannot replace a human mind. I don't think anytime soon. I don't think we're there just yet. Hey everyone, David Bumble back with an Ahamsek. Ben, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me again. It's great to have you back, man. You've got to tell me, you were saying a little bit offline, you've noticed something really new at one of the conferences that you attended. Can you give us an update and why you think this is the, I, I'm, I'm scared to say the hot new thing or something to watch out for? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's new. I mean, attack surface management has been around for years and years. Companies have been doing it, you know, big companies have been after it, but just recently, so about a month and a half ago, about a month ago, maybe, I went to a company, RSA, um, they're big, you know, it's very vendor focused. There's some great research that comes out of it. Great speakers, uh, that villages, you name it. But one of the main trends that I saw this year at RSA was the entire concept of the tax surface management. Um, I think MasterCard got into the recon of tax surface management recently. Microsoft just bought a company. Um, Andiens bought a, another company. And you can see all these big players, you know, these big enterprise companies are getting into the same industry for a reason. There is a reason why everyone wants a piece of this market. And um, it's a new topic. It's, again, it's not a new as in it hasn't been around. It's just a new focus. You know, if you go back to Black Hat, for example, for the past few years, we saw different trends every year or every few years. And I think this year's trend is going to be mostly focused around ASM, also known as tax surface management. And it's just a fancy way of doing reconnaissance and knowing uh, either what your organization has on the internet or as a hacker myself, like a red teamer, what a company has externally facing online. Yeah, I had, I had it in one of my questions and I wasn't sure if we'd have time for it. And I don't know if you want to cover it now or we can cover it in a separate video about like the blockchain. And I mean, obviously with, uh, at the time of this recording, of, you know, Bitcoin or whatever prices are dropping, but it sounds like there's another whole level of pain with like Web3 and a lot of opportunity there is, is is that right there is a lot of opportunities i will not be the right person for web3 give me a few months uh i i am working on content for web3 and like the the blockchain right. and smart contracts i want to learn myself but yes if you're watching this and you think that you're interested in web3 you're interested in the blockchain or smart contracts this is the time to do it it's going to be a while before web2 goes away but at the same time if you're going to want to get involved this is the right way to do it it's the right place and time to do it um it's going to be one of the bigger uh, focus points for a lot of industries. And they're paying extremely amounts of money in the bug bounty scene. I've seen like million dollar payouts uh, wow. for some of these altcoins and it's it's insane. I don't have personal uh, content on this, but I, I host a conference every year named NahomCon that just happened a few months ago. And I had a few people that talked about it and based on the reactions that I saw, it was a really good place to start. And so I those are the only two things that I have to offer personally if people want to get into the smart contracts. The videos are on your channel, right? So yeah. I'll can link them below for people who are interested. Is that right? Yeah, the, the NahamCon 2020 playlist, there's a few, both on like how to approach smart contracts, but also how to attack these crypto platforms or these wallets from a Web 2.0 perspective. So smart contracts, something hot to look at if, you, if you're new to the industry. Um, ASM, something else, yeah? Yeah, there are different parts of the, you know, it, it, they probably will at some point play um, you know, have a hand in each other's industry, you know, but that's a completely different monster of its own that I don't even know how to approach at this moment. Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, that, you know what the problem is? If you knew, you don't want to go after the stuff that everyone else is doing. You want to look at what's coming down the down the chute, if you like, or the next wave. I like to say, you want to ride the wave. So what's the next wave? So these are two. Does any that you... Others that you think people should look at, perhaps that's going to be big in the coming months and years? I think the recent trends I've seen is um, smart contracts are definitely a big trend right now. They're, they're going to yep. be a while, you know, it's, they're going to be around for a very long time. Uh, the ASM thing that we just discussed, I think is just from an industry perspective, it's huge. Um, I yeah. want to say, I, I, I texted my, my co-founder, I was like, Hey, I'm like one ASM away from like being triggered because of how many times I saw attacks of risk management on the walls, people asking <laughs> and talking about it. And you know, it's an industry that I work with. It just, I going into RSA, I did not expect it. And then the third one is, I think APIs, um, 
they're 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 going to be a hot topic. I didn't realize there wasn't a good book on API. There is a few good books. I'm not saying there isn't any. All right. So one of the people that I ran into at uh, B sides Knoxville is Corey, whose uh, book just came out on API hacking. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah, it's uh, hacking APIs. It's out with No Starch Press. Guides you through uh, pen testing and attacking APIs for bug bounties. But I think there's maybe a handful of good API books that are out there, and everything we connect to has an API. Every app you work on your phone, every application on their websites, your bank accounts, all of them communicate with an API. And uh, I th those also go beyond the REST APIs. It could be GraphQL, REST API, and those sort of things as well. I think those are going to be the next big three, big three things, and the um, offensive security hacking realm as well. I'm not saying as a security industry as a whole, because th that's a big umbrella of like content to talk about. But for me, someone who's in the offensive security, bug bounty, pen testing realm, those three are going to be very, very hot and very, very high in demand. And cybersecurity itself, positions in cybersecurity are going to be in high demand for hire. I'm going to ask all the dumb questions like I like to say. I want to make sure that everyone understands this. So let's go back. Can you explain okay. like what is an attack vector and then explain what AS, you've kind of already highlighted, but give us more detail about ASM and why people should care. Yeah, so attack surface management is just, uh, it's to companies I've, uh, I'll put it this way, imagine a company like um, an Apple, for example, or a Microsoft yep. itself. They have, you have Apple at the very top, right? And then Apple yep. owns other products of its own. They have uh, iCloud, they have the iPhone, they have iPad, you know, the Mac OS. Every single one of these have a website. Some of these websites have their own APIs. Some of those APIs have their own, you know, they just, this keeps going. They have marketing sites, whatever, right? And then not only Apple yep. has its own products, this is a, we live in a, you know, in a world where they want to be the, the bigger company. They purchase other companies, they acquire other companies. So then Apple owns something like the Beats by Dre, for example. It's a big example yeah. of it. And then that itself, it becomes another umbrella company under Apple, where they have other assets like their products, their marketing sites, their backends, their APIs, whatever else that comes with it. And that's just a web portion of it, right? It's just the websites that come with it. But now let's think about cameras, printers, other things that a company could have online that could be accessible. Yeah. Whether they're exposed uh, externally or not, they're still an asset that's connected to the internet. And it becomes really hard from an organization's point of view to be able to manage and say, these are everything that we own. And this is not talking about the cloud. This is not talking about the, you know, the S3 buckets and storages, the, the databases, everything and everything that a company has online. So that kind of talks about, yeah, that kind of is what attack service management is, is knowing where are you exposed online and how can an adversary find a vulnerability in one of these assets and be able to break in and maybe breach your parameter and maybe escalate their way all the way through your network. So what's the difference between an attack vector or what is an attack vector and what is an attack surface? Because you, uh, you're managing this from what you're saying, yeah. Sorry, yeah attack vector would be mostly how you do the attack, like what scenario you can find, how do you approach that particular asset, versus the surface is what's exposed. It's the what you do and not how. So to think of the attack vector as the how, and the attack surface okay. as the what. What are you going to attack and how are you going to attack? Those are two different things. And a lot of companies won't, I, I want to say, I don't want to say a lot of companies, but majority of companies, because of how big they are, you know, every day there's a new asset that goes up. Every day there's a new asset that comes up. Developers want to uh, test a new product that they have built or a new, we're going to say app that they have built, for example. That's a new asset yep. that's going to go online because they want to see if it works. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes I forget that person that was working on this big project decides to go and get another job at another company. Who owns that asset now? Is it still online? Is it being updated? Is it taken offline? We don't know. And that's why these companies are saying, hey, we can help you with that. You know, there's big companies that do that and they say, hey, we scan the entire internet. We fingerprint your company and we can say based on XYZ, these criteria, these belong to you. Yeah, in our previous video, you, you used a tool to do um, like a recon of PayPal, I think it was, and you were finding like lots and lots of domains and subdomains that belong to PayPal. How is this different to say just using a recon tool? Is it because the companies are managing it rather than you as an attacker trying to just find stuff? So what we did was a small percentage of how you can track a company's assets. We just looked at open source intelligence, leveraging certification certificates, right? So if you look at just yeah. search transparency itself, that is, we don't know how often that's, that's updated. It's a free source, right? That data that I may have yeah. pulled up on uh, cert.sh may be a week old, maybe a day old. We don't know, right? So these companies have their own way of 
just collecting search transparency data. And uh, you know, outside of that, we don't know, for example, for PayPal, I only looked at the certificates that are, or assets that have a certification attached to them. What about those that don't? What about the IP addresses yeah. they own? What about you know the cloud storages that they have, the S3 buckets or the Azure buckets, what you want to call it? What about those? What about you know the FTP servers, SSH servers that are you know not even web? It's just a box somewhere with an IP address, no web presence, yeah. but you know there could be an SSH or an FTP or even a um, mail server on there, for example. And is are we only concerned with devices connected to the internet, or is there like external slash internal ASM? It could be both. Just because something is internal. It doesn't mean that it's not externally exposed. Misconfigurations happen a lot of times. I've had a, I had a case of this with, I think it was Snapchat. I publicly disclosed this. They had something from their uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment tools, uh, Jenkins, yeah. for example, that had it uh, exposed. And it was supposed to be internal and it was behind Google authentication. So you had to use Google to authenticate and somehow they misconfigured it and I was able to log in with a Gmail account. So just because it's supposed to be internal doesn't mean that, you know, I was like, it's, it's human mistakes. We all make mistakes. Some of us, bigger mistakes on accident happen, stuff like that. And we, it's, Snapchat isn't the only one. I've seen this happen a million of times. And it could also be uh, a piece of information that's left behind, for example, on another server that could give you credentials to log into the CI CD pipelines and uh, tools that are supposed to be internal. So there's, you know, there's the, the attack vector that you mentioned earlier, just because something is internal doesn't mean it's not accessible. There are vulnerabilities that could give you access to those internal networks where you can pivot through things and just make your way up. So easily, if I understand correctly, the, the idea is more and more companies are putting or doing more and more digital stuff. So we're talking about a digital asset, is that right? Correct. So a digital asset depends, the definition of a digital asset depends on the company and the person. I personally define a digital asset, anything that is connected to the internet or anything that's belonging to that company, whether it's your websites, yeah. whether it's your smart devices, whether it's uh, you know an employee's computer that may be having a web server somewhere, it's somehow it's you know exposed online. It could be your GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, whatever code repository you use. It could be your online uh, mobile apps. Those are all assets because they connect back to your infrastructure in some way. And the problem is companies are putting more and more of this stuff online. They don't actually know is is part of the problem. They don't actually know what they've got. Is that right? To some extent, yes. I think so. The older the company, they're probably the harder. I think newer companies yeah. or the smaller companies don't have that kind of an issue. It just depends on how mature the security teams are or how involved they are in the process of launching new products and launching new test environments. How they expose them, how they contain it, how you know it's a behind some sort of firewall. Maybe is the environment protected? It all comes down to those things. But yeah, you're correct. Everything is going online. I mean, look at our medical records now, right? Like, yeah. especially with COVID happening, you know, we all exactly. we were yeah. we weren't we weren't given a heads up of like, hey, by the way, every <laughs> company in the world in six months, you have to go digital first and you have to work remote with everybody. You know, everyone was scrambling. Like, you know, my heart goes out to all the blue teamers and people that were in IT and infrastructure teams that had to figure things out. How do we protect ourselves? And and this is not a this is not a job to people that are non-technical, but you think about it, then the amount of non-technical people that are in a organization is a lot yeah. higher than the people that you know are technical that know how to not click on phishing links, not to click on you know a random Microsoft Word that was sent to you as an email attached as a resume, yeah. for example. There are trainings that happen, but unfortunately, the hackers don't care how good you are as a person; they just care to own your you know your account and be able to leverage it to go through that company's uh, network and get whatever they want out of it. I think it's a really good point. Companies were forced, like almost well, it was literally overnight, yeah, to spin up all kinds of stuff. And unfortunately, and, um, some yeah, some companies were ready for it. They were doing the digital first, yeah. right? Uh, and some companies were, uh, were an office-only company and that doesn't work like that. No, not anymore. So I mean, okay, so people are putting, or companies are putting more and more online. Older companies may not even know what they've got. But um, I think I heard you say, and I'll mention this, you're doing this series, you're doing a more d detailed series about this on your YouTube channel. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, so I just kicked off a series called, so I, I've enjoyed doing these under 10 minute series. I feel like yeah. it's easier to digest 
the content, especially yep. when it's technical and not. I, I try to explain it a way that I would explain it to uh, you know, my cousins that are like 13, 14. What does this thing mean? That's what you, know, you need to, ex- to explain to me, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and it's, if you can't explain that to someone who's not technical, so who, you know, who doesn't know much about that, I can't expect to people that are technical, right? So that's a one portion of it. And the second portion is technically looking at some of these different methods that you can implement internally at a, you know, I'm not saying it's a solution to all your problems. It's a part of a solution that you can implement if you wanted to uh, be able to collect it on your own organization. Uh, but the goal isn't, my audience isn't a lot of blue teamers and security engineers. I have that, you know, audience, but it's a lot of red teamers, pen testers, bug bounty hunters. So I'm bringing that flavor of like, as a bug bounty hunter, you can uh, map out an external surface for a company by doing these things. And if those, you know, engineers want to implement the same thing, they're also welcome to you know, do that. But, or at least they can find a solution that works for them based on these companies that offer them. So you can say, hey, I saw these videos. You know, I've seen these six sources that Ben or Nahamsik has covered in his video. I'm not saying that I'm the source of knowledge for it, but you can see these methods and see if these companies offer those to you as a part of the solution as well. And in today's video, I mean, you, at the time of this recording, you just launched your first video. By the time this video goes live, you probably have more on your channel. Uh, I think you mentioned like Log4j. Uh, as one of the examples. Um, and a lot of people on YouTube, uh, we get these comments, I'm pretty sure you perhaps get them as well, where guys say, why are you showing us this? This this attack is like a month old or a week old. And I think, is, is it true to say that even though like Log4j, just as an example, is something that's been patched, companies still have problems with it? Yeah, I mean, um, so I'm, you know, I'm on Twitter and I, I go down the, the ha- some of these hashtags from like bug bounty hunters. I yeah. still see people getting paid for Log4j. Log4j was a while ago. And com- just because something has a patch doesn't mean it's been patched across the board, right? And that's another thing yeah. with attack surface management. It's not just knowing what's online. It's also about what is on those machines. So from a web server's perspective, it's an Apache server. Does it Apache run on Tomcat? Is it an Nginx? Is it a Windows machine with IIS? What version of it? Are there CVEs for those? Are there actual exploits for those? Are they exploitable? Are they patched? Just fingerprinting and knowing what uh, what's on them. And then beyond the back end of it, what software is on there? Is it a Jira? Is it Grafana? Is it GitHub Enterprise? Is it X? Is it Y? Whatever it is, right? Those all go into attack service management. So you can actually go into your database and go, I want to see every single instance of for example, a Jira that I have online that I may have, or any yep. app that runs on Node.js, for example. And it's very tricky to be able to, you know, some companies are very good at hiding that detail, but when you're good at hiding it, it's going to be harder to track externally uh, from an external point of view like myself or a service that does it. I mean, I, mean, I think that's great. I mean, just, I think you, you highlighted it there that just because a patch has been released doesn't mean it's been fixed by everyone. Companies may not even know that they're using it somewhere in, an application or a stack somewhere, yeah? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what makes uh, ASM such a big thing. It's They don't even know these vulnerable assets are on there. Most companies, again, have a good way of pulling every main uh, application that may have that, may have that backend or may that vulnerability, whatever it is that we're looking at. But honestly, it doesn't mean that it's, they get 100% coverage. You know, I, I still see some old vulnerabilities popping up. You know, it's we yeah. Log4j is just very recent and I still see it. Uh, but you'd be surprised some of these older ones still show up. It's just because companies haven't tracked it properly or it fell through the cracks and they forgot about it. You recently presented at B-Side Knoxville, is that right? That Yeah, I was actually uh, in Knoxville, I want to say about a month and a half ago before RSA. You met, you met someone there who wrote a really cool book recently, yeah? Yeah, I, um, so I went to Knoxville. I was a keynote speaker for it. And when I go to his conferences, I'm not really sure who I would run into, right? They're very local. Yeah. Uh, but um, I met a-, a Happy Hacker, H API Hacker. He's the author of uh, a- Hacking APIs. All right, so we're here with Corey again. Do the book signing here. Awesome, thank you, man. You know, I wanted to reach out to him on Twitter and I just didn't have the, yep. you know, I didn't know how to approach him. And then he's like, oh yeah, that's me. You know, I wrote that book and it's like, holy crap. I'm so glad I ran into him. We <laughs> we chatted a little bit and um, I got his book uh, somewhere on here or in my other um, bookshelf. But yeah, it's a great book on API hacking and uh, I got the pleasure to meet him in person and kind of talk to him. Now, the reason I bring that up is that's another nightmare. I remember a few years, well, I'm assuming it is, a few years ago, there was this talk about APIs of the future. 
And it seems like yeah. we're getting closer and closer to that. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it, the API thing is its own it's its own mountain. <laughs> I don't want to die on right now. But it, again, if you don't know what APIs you have online, how many APIs you have exposed, you know, what APIs are connected to what backends or what product or what you know application, it's a nightmare to manage. Yeah, I mean, I just bring it up because that's just something else that ASM needs to take care of. Yeah, because. You might have a server online and you might just have a website that you think people are um, seeing, but there could be a whole API that's been forgotten yeah. or perhaps hasn't been removed, stuff like that. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, it, it's also beyond that. It could be an internal API, right? That was yeah. supposed to be for testing purposes and you know it was supposed to be internal and it sits on your internal network and somehow some configuration changed and it's suddenly exposed. Or it could be beyond that. It could be, um, I don't think this is a vulnerability of its own, but... It could be that you have a API documentation that's you know sitting online. The API may be offline itself, but the documentation is yeah. still there. Sometimes you see you know API keys in there. Sometimes you see you know specifics of what the API does, what the endpoint is, what parameters it takes. And as a you know as a as a hacker and an adversary, whatever you want to call it, me personally, I'll take that API documentation and I spray that thing across the entire network. Sometimes you know some you know for example on API one. I may need an authentication, you know, token to be able to yeah. interact with it. But on API two, that's the same exact one, the same exact API, but it's a dev instance, for example. I may be able to get bypassed the authentication. So just spray that entire endpoint across the entire network and sometimes it works. ASM is different to Shodan, is that right? Because I so, think the reason I'm asking this is some like pen testers or uh, bug bounty people may see that you know, what's the difference between what you're talking about versus the tools that are already out there? And you've kind of highlighted that already, but could you give us like, what is Shodan? What, what's, how's it different to ASM? And, you know, is yeah. it for a company or is it for an individual or both? So Shodan is a good place to start for both as a hacker, both of an as organization, but what they cover may be different than what you need. So um, I can actually show it if you'd like a little bit. So this is uh, what Shodan looks like when you log in. So I actually have a... Uh, paid account. I believe I have one of the corporate accounts uh, as a partnership with Shodan. They're they're amazing people to work with, incredible people to work with. I have nothing but great things to say about John and his team. But you can still do some of this stuff with a free account. So they have different pricings. You can go look at them on here. You can pay $69 a month up to whatever, like the corporate version of it. Tells you what you get. You can also pay the membership of 49 one time fee that gives you some limited data. If you want to be cheap like me when I first started, just wait till uh, uh, Black Friday shopping comes up and then you can buy it for even cheaper. <laughs> but as a, as a person who's starting on just Shonan recently, I would just say um, get the cheapest one and just get familiar with it. Shonan has a lot of different search queries you can do. So you can pretty much search anything and anything. You can look for products, you can look for host name, you can look for SSL, you, you can just, you name it. So the point of Shodan is they scan the entire internet and they index it. Think about it like a, um, what are those like yellow books, uh, you know, the directory books of like yeah. everything and everything you want. So if you were to look for, uh, give me a company, what is a good company that we could look for for this demo? Well, Apple perhaps, I don't know, or PayPal, whichever you think is like. So we can do something like, yeah, we can go here and we're going to say, I want it to be a host name of apple.com. And this is going to look and say, hey, anything that has apple.com set as its host name that we have found in our database, I want you to look for it. So you can show, you can see there's 82,000 things that come up that has the host name Apple. You know, it has iTunes, it could be apple.com, images, whatever, right? It's not the organization. It just means somewhere, somehow, they connected this to a host of apple.com. But it could also be an org, like we can say, hey, or the organization Apple, what do they own? And it's going to also do this as well. So it's gonna, it might take a while um, for it to come back, but it does give us that as well. So right here, so it's, you know, there's more AA, whatever it is, it's somehow the IP address is owned by Apple Inc. Uh, whatever this one is, this, this may be not owned by them. There is gonna be some false positive, but it looks at, the data that I've connected to and anything that has Apple. So Black Apple is probably not Apple itself, but if you want to make it more accurate, you can click on Apple Inc. and redefine your search. But that just shows and you how many the, devices it's found. That has the specific, based on our search query, correct. So, yeah. so, so let's put it this way. This means that if it's a web app, it is 
hosted on Apple's network itself. So Apple has a network of its own. This is not the cloud. It's just whatever. There's 36,000 things that we have found. It's just somewhere on the Apple's network. It's owned by them. And you can see the city always comes back usually where they are. But yeah, it gives you a good example of it. You can also go as far as looking for a specific product. So if I wanted to look for a product that is, um, let's say a Tomcat. Hopefully I have something with Tomcat for the sake of this demo. Okay, maybe not Tomcat. Maybe we can try something like uh, Apache. This one should work. I've seen what guys it does, use this for like CCTV and stuff like that to find those kind of um, things online. There is a thing called Shodan Safari, yep. People go on Shodan Safaris and they look. <laughs> and you know, the, the things that I'm showing is just my experience with Shodan has been very, very web and offensive security uh, yeah. Yeah. focused. But you're absolutely correct. You can find cameras. You can find, you know, it's, it's incredible what people have found. People have found some like very insane um, sites, like those skater sites, for example, that shouldn't be online. People have found, yep. um, you know, the camera thing is a big one. Like, cameras are inside of people's homes for some reason that are exposed online. Uh, it's, it's, I've seen remote desktops on here, government assets. It's just insane. But yeah, going back to our example, you can see all these different assets that are coming back. And they have an Apache server on here. Uh, you can see that it's come back to server as Apache, and it's let you, it lets you pretty much search through it. But going back to this again, uh, it goes beyond that. There's 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 a book that actually the author of the the founder of Shodan has written. It's very cheap online. You can look for it. Um, I'll see if I can link it at some point. But so one of the things you can do actually is it lets you look at the title, the status of that, um, whatever is in there. So we want to look for a so we want to look for a specific title. I'm going to go back here. We're going to remove the product and we're going to say, hey, give us something with login in it. And hopefully that comes back with something for us. What it's going through is it's looking at every Apple, every asset that's been under the organization Apple, that the title of the web page says a login, whether it's an admin login, a user login, Whatever that is, it's going to look for it and give it back to us. So right now we can see right here, there is a few that came back. There's a login there. Um, Apple Inc. There's another login. Um, so it gives you an idea. So if you're looking for a specific thing across an entire network and you don't want to do your own tooling, you can use Apple itself. Again, we, uh, sorry, not Apple, Shodan itself. Again, I don't know how old this data is. I don't remember how often they share the reports. I think uh, it's right here. I think it says the time. Maybe this is when it was updated last Um it looks like it was from two days ago. So things may have changed, may have shifted, or may have gone offline, but it is a good place. Um, one of the things that I really use as a bug bounty hunter myself, and I enjoy doing, I think this one costs a little bit of money. You can actually monitor a space. So I uh, I do a stream on Sundays when I do, I, you know, I host uh, interviews, but also do live hacking. So one of the targets that we're yeah. hacking on is Disney. Um, I'm monitoring Disney's assets. So I've given them a range of IP address right here. And it's telling me all the open ports. So I can click on this and say, how many ports of 9,600 are open? And it also is showing me potential vulnerabilities of CVEs wow. that are put from 2014. Maybe some of these aren't exploitable, right? But just think, think of how old this is. This is almost 10 years old. And you're just doing this as part of the bug bounty program with Hacker One or something? Correct. Right? Yeah, so I'm you know I'm hacking on Disney. They have a vulnerability disclosure program. You know I'm doing it for fun, but I wanted to teach people how to use Shodan. And this is you know one of the things that you can do. And it also you can set up triggers. For example, that you say, hey, every time there is a new asset that comes up, I want you to send me a Slack message or email me, whatever that is. And it emails you immediately when they discover something new. And you can also see all these different like data from them, where they're hosting things. You can see uh, the, the results, how much has changed. It's gone up. It's gone down. Uh, since I've been monitoring it um, and go on, you know, and you can, uh, depending on what you pay for, I think my account allows me to do like 100,000 IP addresses, um, but the limits are different for each account, but it's a, it's a great place to start. It, it's, again, it's, uh, I don't want to say it's not a good tool. That's not what I'm trying to say, but it's not, it may not be the solution for your organization, depending on what your goals are for your organization, show that maybe it, maybe it not it, but as a bug bounty hunter, as a hacker, uh, I've used it, you know, religiously, and I really enjoy using it, and it's given me some really good data points. And it's it's also fun to look for some of these, you know, random devices that are hosted on Shodan. So if you uh, go down to the filters again on the dashboard, they actually have this called uh, screenshots of industrial control systems. Uh, I'm gonna look for it. We're not gonna click on anything just for my safety and your safety. Yep. But it's you know it's it's scary to see these. I don't even know if it's a real or not. I mean, honestly, I I don't look for these kinds of things. But just seeing these kind of scares me. You know, it's there's a, it. yep. 
It is, yeah. This is in Finland as a password. Hopefully the password isn't password, but uh, <laughs> some of these may be offline again, but it's just, um, it, it just, I, I see this, I go, yep. why? Yep. yep. It's unbelievable. It's very scary. So, so, th so this is a screenshot of that IP address. So Shodan just took a, like a screenshot of the page that it saw when it connected to that IP address. Is that correct? Not, not just the page, the service. This could be you know, some of these are okay. web service. Let me, see, let me click on this. We can actually see the details of all of these on Shodan itself. I don't want to, I don't want to no. send the request, but you can see it says authentication disabled. There's no authentication. Oh, wow. it, it could, you know, you can, it's a, it's a, it shows us a port 5900. Somehow they made a connection and whatever that connection was, um, they were able to see it. I don't even know what this says. There's voltage on there. It says reset alarms. I don't, it, it just, just scares me to see this kind of things online. I mean, th so this is again the, the, the whole point that, um, I see this on YouTube a lot. Guys, when you show like really basic hacking stuff, guys go, this is stupid. No one's ever going to do this. But this is a fine example of, you know, no passwords, no authentication, industrial control system online. I mean, it's just a security problem as a whole. It's not just like the attack service management. It's we always assume yeah. who, so a good example of it, Netflix accounts. Who's going to hack my Netflix account, right? Yep. Who's yep. going to want to hack? You bet people are going to hack your, your Netflix account. It's just, they do it. Your Instagram account, your Facebook. It's just asking yourself, like, who's going to care enough to hack my stuff? It's not about who you are as an individual. They, they don't care about you personally. They're just going to take whatever they can and see how they can abuse it at some point. If they can buy for, you know, buy more stuff, whatever it is. The, the, it's all, the issue is always saying, why or who's going to find this who's going to want to hack my thing and that goes beyond your accounts it goes to the like oh who's going to find this asset that's not protected like who's going to care about my industrial service or my pump or whatever it is that we just saw you would be surprised they would be surprised how they can abuse those in different ways it could be to distribute more attacks it could be malware it could be mining crypto who knows or just to have fun who knows mm -hmm. Yeah. So the difference between Shodan and ASM is, correct me if I'm wrong, I just get the feeling that ASM is more something that companies would have to look at doing to secure the infrastructure. And like Shodan would be more for researchers, pen testers, that kind of thing, bug bounty, hunters. Is that, did I, is that correct to say or is that kind of like? Yes right? or no. Yes and no. I want to say yes and no. Yes. Yep. So yep. ASM, so Shodan, the, the record doesn't say we're attack surface management. I don't think I've seen that wordage being used, but they are essentially giving you the ability to use their data to manage your attack surface. You know, what I showed with Disney yeah. earlier on the screen, where I said, hey, I can put an IP range or a domain and it's gonna monitor it for me. You can't use that to manage your attack surface, but is that the right solution for your company? I don't know. So they are giving you, Shodan's position, I think from what I understand is, we have data, you want our data, pay for it, use it as you want. We're gonna give you the tools, you can yeah. just make it what you want. They're not saying, you know, we want a tax service management company. They're just saying we have the data, we know everything almost on the internet that's on there. You choose if you wanna use it or not. Just before this call started, I looked on Twitter and I saw that uh, JP Morgan was fined like $200 million wow. or something for communicating about financial strategy using non-sanctioned applications. So they say he had no in no insider trading, no nothing except shadow IT. So that's another nightmare, isn't it? Where employees are perhaps spinning up stuff stuff on um, um, AWS or Azure or whatever. Yeah. And developers are using stuff out of the scope of corporate IT. That's just another whole can of worms, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know the specifics of JP Morgan's case, but it is. Uh, there's been times where um, I found an asset that the company says, "Hey, uh, we don't think this belongs to us. It's not in our, you know, in our infrastructure or it's not in our accounts. You can't find it." And I go, "Well, um, everything about this screams your name. You know, the the um, the person that's created this has a you know at your company email address. This is their name. The LinkedIn shows that they work for you and." I'm pretty sure yeah. a company's name is mentioned a lot in this thing. And it's not because they don't want to use this. It's just, I mean, people work extended hours. People have nightmares of, you know, sorry, to have deadlines that they have to meet. And there is very easy yeah. to forget those things. You know, it's, I'll give an example of that. That happens to me a lot. I have my, I have two browsers at work. I have my personal browser on there that I use for like Twitter and, you know, looking at like the stuff yeah. that I want to look at. And I have my work browser. There's been so many times that I accidentally click on a meeting that's, you know, I just send me a Zoom link or a Google Hangouts link on Slack and I click and I accidentally join on my personal account. And I go, oh, nope, close. And I go back to my, it happens a lot. It just, it's that quick to happen. You just lose track because of how fast you're moving. You're multitasking, you're trying to meet your deadlines, whatever it is uh, that happens. It's unfortunate, um, you know, the company has to pay the price for it. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason I mentioned that is it's just another asset 
or another thing that people have to worry about? I mean, I don't know how CISOs sleep at night. It's uh, I don't. There's, there's a reason why I'm not built to be a CISO, and there's a reason why I'm not <laughs> yeah. built for the blue team. I love. I my heart goes out to the blue teamers, all my friends that are blue teamers, or people that I know that are blue teamers, my followers, whatever. Every time there's a new vulnerability, and it sucks because like. I feel like eight out of 10 times, these big things happen on a Friday at like 3 p.m. Yeah. It's like they almost Christmas plan it. Stupid, right, yeah. right. Yeah. And it's just like almost, it feels like they do it on purpose. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's insane. I have friends that are in incident response and like, you know, right now they're enjoying their lives. They're traveling, they're doing things. And they're like, it's not always going to be like this. We know it's going to, you know, stuff is going to hit the fan and we have to be working extended hours, you know, past 4 a.m. sometimes on the weekends. So let's talk about your job because you mentioned like uh, like using two browsers. You give us last time I, we spoke. You, I think, had just left Hacker huh. One, or you were about to leave them. Um, what are you up to these days? I think last time we spoke, I was maybe unemployed at the time. I took a you know few weeks off. I want to take some time off. So I'd been working at Hacker One for six years. I joined them six years ago as an intern. Uh, I did my six years. I, I loved working for that company, but eventually just was time for a new adventure. I didn't know what I yep. wanted to do. So I took some time off and I have a friend of mine. His name is Olivia Big. I've known him since he was very, very young. I want to say he was like 15 or 16. And uh, he had just recently founded a company named Hadrian. And, you know, he's always told me like, hey, one day, you know, I'm going to uh, do this thing. I'm going to make this company happen. And I want you to, you know, come and work with us. And I kept telling him, Ooh, you know, once you get it going, you get funding and you come to me with the news, we'll do it. And then he came to me and was like, hey, uh, it's happening. Like we've, the company is happening. My, me and my co-founders are here. Like we have an office now. We have the funds. Like, what do you think? And this is right when I'm just thinking about like, you know, not working for a while. And uh, we talked and uh, what they do is very, it's it's something that I'm very passionate myself. You know, we talked about the tax service management Um and the people that I work with are incredible. I've I got to be a part of a team of hackers who are building automations around some crazy stuff. Maybe hopefully we'll uh, talk about some of those uh, in the future at one of the upcoming conferences. Uh, I can't spoil anything, but yeah, they're they're doing some really innovative things, and uh, I'm incredible, incredibly happy and grateful to be a part of the team. And I can't wait to see what we build and uh, see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking at the website. They, um, you, I mean, you, you you tell us some more details, and I mean, I'll just say this for everyone watching: this is not sponsored. It's just nice to hear stories about what people are doing, and I think it's a. Now that you've explained why you joined it, it makes sense because I when I saw you. Your, your profile change. I was thinking, wow, you know, to get someone like Ben on board in a startup, must there must be some good reason why you're doing it. And I'm, I'm assuming they, I think it's, they, um, they're using hackers like yourself to help companies with um, ASM and other things. Is that right? Yeah. So what we're doing essentially is we, you know, we have a few customers of ours that we're working with, but uh, we, we take those customers in, it's an ASM, it's a tax service management of some sort. Um, it's beyond a tax risk That's why I say of some sort. It's not just you know for us to discover what they own, but we also try to implement automated things and event-based things that happen. I'm trying to see how I can explain this to the best of my knowledge or the best of my capability. But we, it's the whole idea of we see one thing, we are fingerprinted, and based on that fingerprint, how do we? What is the attack vector? How do we approach it? So not only we're we identifying assets for those companies, but we automatically are con continuously scanning their environments and. I'm monitoring them for changes and that sort of stuff. Um, so it's just hackers building automation and making sure we can cover our customers to the best of our capability. We were speaking about this offline, and I, I don't expect you to tell us the future, but um, in your gut, do you still think there's going to be a role for humans to do more and more of this? Or do you think automation is is going to take a lot of the like basic work away? Like when it comes to bug bounty, perhaps, or like asset management stuff like that. I don't think we're. I don't think humans are going to be replaced with automation anytime soon. The humans are still the people that are finding the flaws. You know, they're they're automated. They're automated tools for code review, for scanning vulnerabilities. There's great uh, scanners out there that they could do this, but they still miss things. There's a reason why companies pay for automated scans and also manual pen testing. You cannot replace a human mind. I don't think anytime soon. I don't think we're there just yet. But also, you know, researchers that are out there, great security researchers um, that are finding you know, James Kettle, um, Oren Sire. There's some really, really good people that are finding flaws and they're digging deep. And I don't think automation is going to be able to replace that anytime soon. Just as we were talking, I had this thought about um, ASM is different to inventory management, like a solar winds or some other application out there that gives you an inventory of, of devices that you have. 
This is specifically looking for vulnerabilities. Is, is that correct to say? I'm, I don't know per se. I don't really know, to be honest. But um, if it's if it's just devices, that could be just what you have across your organization. It could be the, you know, the cell phones, the to push updates and that sort of stuff. I don't know exactly what product it would be with SolarWinds, but it's usually to manage the devices of your employees. Let's say if it's a device management software, that technically is those those devices, like this work laptop of mine or my cell phone, it is technically an it is technically an um, asset, but doesn't have access to user data, right? Is it, you, yeah. know, is, you know, is it just being used to check my email on this thing? Technically an asset, but does it host uh, any user PIIs? Probably not. So you have to distinguish the difference between those two things. You know, there's software that gives the organization the capability of knowing, you know, how many uh, MacBook they have on their, you know, in their organization, how many Windows machines they have, how many of them are outdated, how many are running Chrome that's outdated and on which platform. Yeah. You can s consider those as an asset because Yes, you know, if someone owns a device on a network, they're going to pivot to that device. If it's not up there, they're going to own that computer. Who knows? It could be a developer's account. They could, you know, they could leverage it to go up. But with ASM, it's just mostly my focus is with ASM is the external attack surface of web presence, where there's customer data, where things could go wrong uh, outside of just the employees itself. It sounds like this is something that's going to be big in the, in the next few years. It's already growing. And I mean, if you're spotting the signs of this, at RSA and places, then it's something that I think a lot of people should look at. Where's where can where can people get more information? I'm assuming. I mean, I'd recommend first places on your YouTube channel because you're starting the series. Um, you, are you going to show tools and stuff like that there? And you know, are there any other resources that you can tell us about? So hopefully, my goal, and I'm, I'm saying hopefully because I don't know where it's going to head, <laughs> be headed at this point. But I want to pretty much talk about every single different uh, tool that's out there that could be used. I want to stay on the free side of things, so on the OSINT and yeah. the freemiums maybe or whatever you want to call them. And then I want to build a framework around it eventually at some point. I'm like, these are the tools you can use now to do this. And then how you extend that, uh, you know, that attack surface. Um, there are different ways you can do, there's, I think there are some great resources online. The, the beauty of the bug bounty scene is that uh, a lot of these hackers are willing to share. I, yeah. it, you know, the, the ones that are willing to share that don't stop. Uh, there are some really good research out there. Uh, there are some great tools out there. Um, I would just look up attack surface management. If I wouldn't look up attack surface management alone, I would look up more uh, recon workflows, maybe on a bug bounty focus, because bug bounty hunters have done a lot of that research. Uh, a great example of it, you know, uh, Olivia, one of our, you know, my, my co founder of my company, he, that a lot of bug bounty hunting, and now we are creating a tool that does that stuff, right? Another friend of mine, Shapam Shah, he has a company similar to what we do. Uh, he's they've created some massive um, resources. Dan Meisler, uh, who's a great mind, uh, he talks about ASM some in some cases. Uh, there's just a lot of different. It just depends on what the finish of ASM or recon you want to understand. Um, recon is very, very huge. It's content man content discovery, attack surface. Uh, sorry, there is content discovery, asset discovery, and it just it, it just blows up for each of those, and it gets huge. But yeah, there is different resources. Uh, if anyone's going to be at DefCon, uh, I personally will be there myself, happy to talk about these kinds of things, and uh, I may or may not have a training at DefCon on attack surface management and recon as well. So if anyone wants to, you, you know. You can't tease us, so you, you're gonna be talking about it at DefCon. Def yes, I will right? be, yeah, I will, hopefully I'll yep. be doing, the reason why I say is it's like things are up in the air with DefCon and it's very early to talk yeah. about it, but I, I did get my, I did announce on Twitter that it was approved or uh, accepted, and I'm also going to be hopefully hosting a few panels on Red Team, Bug Bounty, and Recon as, or at ASM as well. You go to conferences. If you see someone talking about tax service management, go to it. If you go to a, if you have a black hat pass, go to the, you know, if you have a business pass, especially that's really cheap, go to these vendors and watch what they, you know, some of our, you know, I know that it's very sales driven and the point is to get sales going up, but me going to RSA, I, I watched a bunch of the demos and I was like, holy crap, like, cool. Like I didn't think about this asset or, you know, I didn't think that this was a thing or this was a business. MasterCard is doing something incredible with, uh, with recon with, uh, on blockchain. It's, they call it recon, and it's not a tax service management itself, but what they're doing is similar, but on the on a transactional sense of like making sure fraud isn't happening using OSINT. And it just, I, I went to the guys like, hey, I'm not gonna buy your product, but I'm just really intrigued by what you guys do. Can you give me your sales pitch? And I was just mind blown by it. That's great. Uh, and I was just like, cool, like there's, there's so many things that are happening. Go to these conferences. Don't be afraid to walk up to the speaker and say, hey, I enjoyed your talk. Can I bother you with a couple of questions? We, we go to these conferences for those reasons. We want to answer those questions. We want to network. We want to educate people. Go talk to these folks. Uh, they're there to help you out.
Now, you know, it, it's always nice to have someone who's in this space with lots of experience like you have. Um, and I understand it's like it's a specific niche, but for people who want to be like you or want to, you know, do something similar to you, it's fantastic to get your input. Just before we wrap up, the, the you, are you going to be covering APIs on your channel as well? Yes, at some point. So I want to... I used to be the person that was like, I want to do all these things. Like, I, give me everything. I want to do it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I've learned to say no to myself, to say, hey, dude, like yeah. just one project at a time, like baby steps. With Black Hat and Defcon coming up right now, I'm more focused there. But yeah, APIs are something that I'm really interested in. I cover them in my streams usually. It's just, you know, people ask me, how do you approach an API? But I'm hopefully going to do a series on it as well at some point. Um, Thanks to you, you know, after the last time we talked offline, it was a there was a switch that hit in my head, and I was like, oh, you know, there is like there is a need now. If there is a need, it's now for me to step in the role of a content creator that could help people yep. learn these things and be able to explain them. It's just I didn't know how to do. I didn't have that uh, the firm or love. How do I explain these things to people? And I think the ten minute series are um, the way to go. So hopefully, I'll make a few videos on API hacking as well at some point. Ben, thanks so much for sharing your experience with all of us. And, you know, thank you for being such a nice person and helping others. I really appreciate it. And we all, you know, thank you for, you know, being willing to share for free on Twitch and on YouTube and elsewhere. Um, I'll put all your links below, but, you know, thanks so much. Of course. Uh, life's too short to not share, you know, your knowledge with people and exactly. uh, not elevate each other. So kudos to you as well for doing what you do and highlighting the people that are in the community and putting in their work and uh, giving them a space and a, you know, a spotlight to be able to talk about the things that they're passionate about. I appreciate it. Ben, thanks so much. Thank you.